the 16th century, where he is identified without any question at all with the devil. And then shortly after this, about 10 years after that, in uh, 1560, another version of the story brings in, connects the Piper story with the rat story. There are many stories about mm, magicians, musicians, who have used their powers to rid places of vermin, be it rats or mice or whatever. But then, inter interestingly enough, some new fiction had to be brought in to connect the stories. And that, of course, found its expression in the contract made between the piper and the town of Hamelin. He came to the town, he s realized how terrible the situation was, he made a commercial offer, which was quite simply, I can get rid of the rats for a certain sum of money, which had to be agreed on, a contract. And the town elders accepted this, he got rid of the rats, but then they, that is the elders of the town, ratted on him. They reneged on their commitment and he took appropriate action from his point of view. And so the fact that the piper was cheated mitigates against the whole, or militates against the whole question of whether he can be identified with evil per se and the town people were his victims because they themselves had contributed to this sad event. And we see, I think we can relate this question of money and contracts to the situation in Europe, particularly in Germany, in the latter half of the 16th century. We mustn't forget there had been terrible unrest, social unrest. And in fact, at the beginning of that century, or the end of the 15th century, a figure known as the Piper of Niklashausen, Pfeiffer von Niklashausen, uh, instigated a rebellion among the peasantry against the prevailing social system. Again, why was he a piper? Uh, as though the use of music had some kind of subversive political effect. And uh, I personally would argue that the whole story, as it's gelled in the uh, 16th century, expresses misgivings not so much against heretics as against uh, people fermenting social unrest at a time when the old feudal system was dissolving and capitalism was on the rise. And then, what about Browning's version? Interestingly enough, um, a psychologist, a person interested in uh, depth psychology and uh, perhaps developing the theories of uh, Jung, the great founder of um, a certain branch of modern psych psychological theory, said, in fact, that the piper, far from being the devil, is a representation of Jesus Christ. And um, I think it's pretty clear that though he wrote his article in Italian, he refers very much to the text of Browning's poem, where the piper plays three notes. Could this be an allusion to the Trinity, as this psychologist thinks, or could it be a reference to the three days, the time of the resurrection? And there are other indications that one can find from a very close reading of the text that uh, at least indicates that Browning associated the Pied Piper more with Jesus than with the devil, but not on a purely religious basis, I think he associated the artist, the musician, the poet, very much with um, the divine, the sublime.
and we notice that we note that also from his other works. So we see this story has a great deal of depth to it that um, expresses itself on the surface in certain metaphors. But obviously there is some very close connection between the piper and some great mystic power, be this good or evil, or perhaps the relationship of both good and evil, which I think is the most likely, uh, the most promising avenue of interpretation. In fact, it's interesting to note how the story evolved um, up to the point when rats entered the story. I was visiting Hamelin a couple of months back. I was reading the um, very, very long and detailed compilation of the versions of the story by Hans Dobertin in the, in the town archives. I came across his theory that the Pipe Piper was in fact Nikolaus von Spiegelberg, the reference to Koppen being uh, an allusion to some sea, tragedy at sea. But I had noticed that there was a town in the immediate neighborhood called um, Koppenbrugge. Koppen again, could that have some connection with Koppen, Koppelberg, as uh, known to those who uh, read the early versions of the Piper story. So on the spur of the moment, rather late in the day, in fact, I took the train to this place, Koppenbrugge, not knowing even if I could stay the night, uh, on a hunch that perhaps something interesting could be discovered there. And uh, it was getting dark, and I noticed some dark mountain looming or high hill looming on the horizon. I kind of sensed, could that be the Koppelberg? Fortunately, I did find a hotel, um, Hotel zum Eat, uh, I-T-H, and um, I arranged to stay the night. And at the bar, there was only one person who frequented the bar at that time, a certain man of about 50, and he soon noted my interest in the Pied Piper, and uh, his eyes glowed with some kind of intense interest. And he produced, from somewhere in that room, some booklets explaining that, in fact, according to a current theory, Koppenberg was in fact that very hill that I had seen. It is no longer known as uh, Koppenberg, but as the um, Itberg, which by the way, this Itberg uh, still has many romantic associations, a kind of never-never land to which uh, songs in the musical Rats refers. And he said that he was personally convinced that the Pied Piper, in fact, Niklaus von Spiegelberg, who established a very um, strong authority in that town, led the 130 children to Koppenbrugge. Not only there, but led them up, somewhere up this hill, where it became extremely rocky and cavernous, and that some terrible misfortune befell the 130 young persons. This could have been some kind of geological shift, an earthquake, or more probably, they were led to their death. Why should that be? Well, the theory goes that this mountain area was used by those who performed certain unconventional, um, unorthodox rites going back to pre-Christian times, one might say nature worshippers, whatever. And it 
apparently paid Spiegelberg to eliminate this source of trouble by a very radical and brutal means. A few days later, I, in fact, went up this hill and saw some of the sites where uh, this event could have taken place. And um, I must admit, it was a very eerie kind of scenario. And the uh, director of the museum in Koppenbrugge, a certain Gernot Husam, has written a very scholarly work on uh, arguments why the thesis I've just proposed is valid. And he can uh, adduce evidence showing that uh, earlier this hill was in fact known as um, Koppenberg. And he goes further in, into the history of that period and um, far from stating that uh, Niklaus von Spiegelberg died at sea in some distant place, um, that because he'd become involved in a very bad, violent act, he had to leave the scene. I'm not saying which theory can be proved, but it seems to me uh, more plausible that the source of the story should refer to a place in the immediate vicinity of Hamelin, because that exactly is what the story originally says, that he led them from the east gate, eastwards, to a certain place within walking distance, evidently. There is, in fact, a picture um, of the place to which the Pied Piper led the children. And I think it'd be, it's interesting to have a look at this picture. The picture which I think is a very interesting <coughs> source of um, evidence was made by a certain Augustin von Mörsberg from Elsass who traveled around parts of Europe making pictures and uh, doing a great deal of historical research. And I think this picture does indicate the depth of research he must have <coughs> engaged in. The picture dates from the year 1592. If we look at it closely, we see three stags three deer, and uh, three deer were, the, the emblems of three deer were in the coat of arms of the house of uh, Spiegelberg, the Count Spiegelberg, this dynasty that established itself in um, Koppenbrugge way back in the uh, 13th century and um, continued for centuries further. We also see the path along which the children were led, leading from the east gate of uh, the city or the town of Hamlin, in accordance with tradition. The path they took leads to a place of execution. We see gallows and a wheel, an instrument of torture. And that would correspond to the um, idea put forward in a number of documents that Calvary was in fact a place of execution where the gallows would have stood. Another aspect of the concept Calvary in the Middle Ages was that it represented a skull. One might think here of Golgotha in Hebrew, the place of Christ's crucifixion, but to the medieval mind it symbolized the gaping jaws of hell into which uh, sinners, particularly heretics and the worst uh, 
offenders against the medieval church would have been swallowed, indicating that, um, shall we say, official you know, guardians of the church would have regarded the Pied Piper as some kind of leader of unchristian people.